हेलो डॉक्टर चंद्रा आई एम ऑडिबल यस मैडम यू आर ऑडिबल ओके थैंक यू गुड मॉर्निंग एंड अ वेरी वॉर्म वेलकम टू वन एंड ऑल प्रेजेंट हियर टू द सेलिब्रेशन ऑफ नेशनल साइंस डे 2021 द I know I still know The year 2020 is the most unforgettable and scary because of COVID-19 pandemic that has caused so much misery. It has shown humanity that our ill treatment of the planet has consequences. Today, the main focus of the international community is what needs to be done on sustainability and how to do it. how to seriously make effort in solving the triple planetary crisis nature loss climate change and pollution which are closely linked to each other to do this all the nations must commit more strongly to the sustainable development goals with a focus on nature based solutions since this is the need of the hour we thought the best way to celebrate science day with this theme and our today's lectures focus on this going local for global impacts a conversation about eco sensitive technology on behalf of department of physics i welcome you all once again to this event let us formally begin our program with welcome address by professor p parameshwara over to you sir thank you madam a very good morning to one and all today we are celebrating national science day uh, and in fact uh, it was supposed to celebrate on 28th of february uh, due to some final uh, inconveniences we plan to celebrate today 14th march 2021 and uh, incidentally uh, this is uh, this day also very uh, remarkable and uh, special day as this is uh, today is the birthday of one more great scientist Albert Einstein, and uh, it is very meaningful to celebrate this National Science Day today, and we are all here to uh, enjoy this day to celebrate National Science Day 2021. On this event, we have with us architect Nitin M S as chief guest and architect Chinmayi M S as guest of honor with us today to have a conversation about eco-sensitive technology. 
on going local for global impacts on behalf of the national institute of engineering and department of physics i welcome both architect nitin ms and architect uh, chinmay ms to this event welcome you both and also our beloved principal professor nv raghavendra uh, was supposed to join with us uh, due to some reasons uh, he is not able to uh, join with us anyhow uh, he has supported this event well and uh, i warm welcome to professor raghavendra also in his absence and today's program is highly supported by our senior professor professor r gopal krishnaras and also our uh, head of the department professor s dureswami i welcome both dr gopal krishnaras and professor dureswami to this event welcome you sir i welcome all the hods of the national institute of engineering deans and other faculty who have joined this program today welcome to all and also even though it's sunday we have 100 and plus students with us who have joined this event to take the benefit of this national science day celebration and i welcome all the student participants to this event welcome to all i also extend a very warm welcome to the members of organizing committee who put a uh, very much effort in organizing this event today i welcome uh, dr dr go uh, deeparas dr nita s dr chandra and dr sankarshan bm welcome to all and also i welcome the man management uh, uh, managing committee uh, who have supported and constantly supporting to organize this pro uh, this kind of programs from the department side i welcome to all the members of our managing committee and finally i welcoming one and all i just uh, hand over to professor tipars thank you ma'am thank you one and all thank you sir i now request professor s dores swami head of the department physics department to brief about the program thank you sir thank you dr deepa the national science day is uh, celebrated in india on 28th february each year to mark the discovery of uh, raman effect by indian physicist sir chandrashekara venkata raman on 28th february 1928 uh, to commemorate and honor this event always in the future the national council for science and technology communication asked the government of india to designate 28th february as national science day and the first national science day was celebrated on february 28 1987 the basic objective of uh, observing this national science day is to spread the message of importance of science and its application among the people some of the activities of the day are the technical paper presentations by students there will be debates quiz competitions lectures uh public speeches radio tv talk shows etc the theme of the theme for national science day 2021 is future of sti impacts on education skills and work the national science day 2021 aims to motivate the students to gain hands on experience in the field of science so keeping this uh, uh say the theme in view uh, we had conducted a model building competition based on the concept best out of waste architect ms chinmay ms one of the resource persons for this program also is the judge of this competition she will be announcing the result of the winners of this competition have a interesting sessions have interesting interesting sessions have a good day thank you thank you sir Uh, today we have two young architects who have involved in many economic and eco-friendly projects and guiding many students in the same field i now request dr chandra to introduce the chief guest of the day architect nitin ms over to you dr chandra okay thank you madam a very good morning to one and all it's a great pleasure to introduce 
architect Nitin Yemis is an architect practicing economically viable and eco-friendly construction and design. He completed his bachelor degree in architecture from RV School of Architecture, Bangalore and masters in sustainable architecture from MEA School of Architecture, Calicut University. Currently, he is the principal architect of his architectural design firm. His fields of interest are natural construction materials, building biology and economically sustainable construction. He specializes in use of lime and other natural materials as a low carbon footprint alternatives. He has published and presented his thesis paper in Metagreen Dimensions, International Conference on Performance of Built Environment, Trivendrum. He has been involved in many experimental construction projects of economic and eco-friendly houses. Uh, with this, once again, I welcome you, sir. Now, over to Professor Deepa, madam. Over to you, madam. Thank you, sir. Uh, I now request uh, Dr. Nita to introduce today's guest of honor, architect Chinmayi, who is also the judge of the national level competition, best of the place. Over to you, Dr. Nita. Thank you, Dr. Deeparas. Good morning, everyone. It's a great pleasure for me to introduce today our guest of honor, architecture Chinmay MS, who is going to talk to us about a conversation about eco-sensitive technology. Ms. Chinmay MS is an architect practicing eco-friendly construction and design. Her fields of interest are natural construction technology, eco-conscious life practices, and building biology. She has a bachelor's degree in architecture from SJB School of Architecture and Planning, Bengaluru. She has conducted various hands-on natural construction workshops and specializes in earth construction. She has been involved in many experimental construction projects of eco-friendly and economically viable houses. She has led the design, documentation and execution teams at Sacred Grove's Aroville. She currently associates with Sacred Grove's Aroville as their design coordinator in their sustainable housing community project and works under Mr. Manu Gopalan in his architecture firm, Arthas Aroville. She has been the course coordinator for regenerative architecture stream of Padra online course conducted by Sacred Grove's Aroville. Previously, she associated with R Leaf Construction Mysuru in various eco-friendly construction projects. So without further ado, now I request Mrs. Chin, Ms. Chinmay to deliver the talk. Thank you, Dr. Nita. I take this opportunity to thank Ms. Chinmay, who accepted to judge of a competition and also gave away the lecture. Uh, over to you, Ms. Chinmay. Good morning, everyone. Um, I, I'd like to thank uh, Physics Department of NA College for giving giving us this opportunity to share um, the the experience that we've had in our professional practice as architects. And I'd especially like to thank Dr. Deepa Ars for um, inviting us uh, for this particular event. So, um, without further ado, let me start presenting my screen, and uh, we'll. Uh, I'll, I shall start the conversation about this eco eco sensitive technologies. Okay. Um, all right. Is my screen visible? Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's presenting. Uh, it's visible. All right. Uh, is my screen visible with the uh, Presentation. Yes, ma'am. Uh, all right. So, going local for global impacts. Uh, so, the reason that we named uh, it as going local for global impacts is because most of the global problems that we are facing, like uh, it was mentioned previously on in this event, that uh, climate crisis and uh, biodiversity loss, resulting in such a a global pandemic mostly has a lot of uh, local causes or local solutions that can be offered. 
So today I'd like to discuss and shed light on a few of those. So Ma'am, when we, uh, excuse me. Uh, yes. That one more, uh, the small slide is, has come in front. Uh, in the slide three oh. of fifty-eight. Just take it off so that uh, the presentation will be visible. All right, ma'am. Yeah. Uh, it, it's gone now, yeah, right? It's it's fine. It's fine. Yes. So when we say every time, uh, in the timeline of, of human history, every every era has had its own issues and today's today we have a lot of issues like poverty global health decline and food food shortage and many more but the environmental causes can be a deal breaker especially in this time and uh, we are currently in a time where we are seeing physical effects and impacts of the, uh, you know the horrific effects that it can actually have um so what the global leaders have to say about this is that we are the first generation to feel the impact of climate change and we are the last generation that can do something about it so as as engineers who are who mostly assembled here and people of science i feel like we take most responsibility in we need to take most responsibility in bringing about change and working towards technologies and innovations that can bring about a um, a more healthier planet and uh, provide long term solutions for these crises so uh, let's take a look at how the planet we currently live in it it wasn't always like this as we know we've studied uh, you know in our basic sciences we have come across in schools and colleges it took our current planet earth billions of years to reach the stable state that it has right now so, so and it was the condition the natural environment was not always this stable like we know the dinosaur the dinosaurs came and went and the neanderthals and we are a product of evolution across billions of years so our ecosystem right now has reached a very subtle balance um it it, it offers such a beautiful balance that every system that is in place in this ecosystem is cyclic in nature and each system sustains one another in a way that is that is so beautifully managed in its in, in its functionality uh, we can consider earth as one machine that is running smoothly on its own which is a, which is of perpetual nature one moment please excuse me hello uh, yeah your visit yeah. you are audible yes i'm sorry for that uh, yeah, that's a okay. disturbance yes um so there are so many systems in this earth right uh, we have the biodiversity and the species interaction and we have on the other hand and we have cities and human world they seem like two different worlds where a uh, human civilization is currently so disconnected to forest environment and farming but uh, as a matter of fact the whole earth is interconnected in its in how it functions so right now what is happening is um this subtle balance is stripped off because of uh, human intervention um so if we the most basic example here we can take you know we'll probably be rem reminding ourselves of the uh of the you know basic environmental science textbook here when we go back to water cycle 
where the water is such a beautiful natural resource and uh, life would probably not have been possible without water and nature has a way of moving in all three strata where uh, you know on the earth surface in the atmosphere as well as the subsurface of the earth and balancing itself out through water cycle similarly other elements in nature like carbon and nitrogen also has its own cycle so these are the aspects that has that provides balance into nature and when we come to biodiversity especially um we have to appreciate the diversity which in which the earth functions the microorganisms and the scale, and the scale that it spans to with the flora and fauna and um, any slight and today because of the human intervention we are losing a lot of type, a lot of types of species and the impacts of such biodiversity loss although not directly visible are very are very much uh, happening uh, because as i mentioned before we seem to be living in two very different worlds in the sense that we do not come across the natural environment of how the earth functions uh, because since the civilization has progressed we have evolved into cities and villages so um because we do not witness it it becomes invisible so i uh, so this is one very famous graphic that you probably have come across where humans we consider ourselves as very intellect intellectual beings but whereas we are just another part of the ecosystem so i'd like to uh provide one very classic example of how the ecosystem balances out itself so the one i would like to present is an example from yellowstone national park in the united states so in this case what happened was in 1920 the wolves from the national park disappeared because of human intervention they were hunted down and killed by the hunters so what happened for the uh, let's look at a video uh video uh mr sankarshan could you please share the video from link 1 uh, give a moment please yes. uh should i stop sharing my screen uh yeah you can okay thank you exciting scientific findings of the past half century has been the discovery of widespread trophic cascades a trophic cascade is an ecological process which starts at the top of the food chain and tumbles all the way down to the bottom and the classic example is what happened in the yellowstone national park in the united states when wolves were reintroduced in 1995 Now we we all know that wolves kill various species of animals but perhaps we're slightly less aware that they give life to many others Before the wolves turned up they'd been absent for 70 years that the numbers of deer because there was nothing to hunt them had built up and built up in the Yellowstone Park and despite efforts by humans to control them they'd managed to reduce much of the vegetation there to almost nothing they'd just grazed it away but as soon as the wolves arrived even though they were few in number they started to have the most remarkable effects first of course they killed some of the deer but that wasn't the major thing much more significantly 
they radically changed the behavior of the deer. The deer started avoiding certain parts of the park, the places where they could be trapped most easily, particularly the valleys and the gorges. And immediately those places started to regenerate. In some areas, the height of the trees quintupled in just six years. Bare valley sides quickly became forests of aspen and willow and cottonwood. And as soon as that happened, the birds started moving in. The number of songbirds and migratory birds started to increase greatly. The number of beavers started to increase because beavers like to, to eat the trees. And beavers, like wolves, are ecosystem engineers. They create niches for other species. And the dams they built in the rivers um, provided habitats for otters and muskrats and ducks and fish and reptiles and amphibians. The wolves killed coyotes. And as a result of that, the number of rabbits and mice began to rise, which meant more hawks, more weasels, more foxes, more badgers. Ravens and bald eagles came down to feed on the carrion that the wolves had left. Bears fed in it too, and their population began to rise as well, partly also because there were more berries growing on the regenerating shrubs. And the bears reinforced the impact of the wolves by killing some of the calves of the deer. But here's where it gets really interesting. The wolves changed the behavior of the rivers. They began to meander less. There was less erosion, the channels narrowed, more pools formed, more riffle sections, all of which were great for wildlife habitats. The rivers changed in response to the wolves. And the reason was that the regenerating forests stabilized the banks so that they collapsed less often, so that the rivers became more fixed in their course. Similarly, by driving the deer out of some places and the vegetation recovering on the valley side, there was a soil erosion because the vegetation stabilized that as well. So the wolves, small in number, transformed not just the ecosystem of the Yellowstone National Park, this huge area of land, but also its physical geography. Mr. Sankarshan for the uh, video. Let me present my screen again. Uh, is my screen visible? Yes, yes, yes. Mm -hmm. um, okay. So, what we saw in the particular video was biodiversity loss of one particular species from one area, the National Yellowstone National Park. Fortunately, the case of Yellowstone National Park was reversible over time. And in our lifetime, we are able to witness what happens when we lose a, bio when we lose a certain species from the area and what happens when we can recuperate it. But what happens when an entire species is wiped off the planet? We can only imagine the kind of loss that we, we have caused ourselves because as much as the beavers and the bears depended on the wolves to thrive unknowingly, we also depend on many, many, many creatures that we have unfortunately lost because of, because of human activities as well as not natural causes undeniably. And that is why protecting natural reserves become extremely important. Um, so that is one example on a global scale as to what is happening in another country uh, and which has an impact on the earth. Let's look into our own country. Uh, the case, the recent case of uh, Molem and Bhagwan Mahavir National Park, where there are three project proposals uh, happening and uh, which cuts through the biodiversity hotspot, which is a UNESCO World Heritage Site. 
and the reason for this development is particularly for coal transportation from Karnataka to Goa, um, which also can happen uh, otherwise. So this is basically to feed the industries more. Of course, uh, development and amenities are important. But at the same time, while we consider the costs of development and road transport and electricity, what we are neglecting right now is the cost at which the nature works. We cannot put a price on the natural services that nature offers, like purifying our air, uh, emitting oxygen and taking in carbon dioxide, so they are carbon sinks, and effectively regulating the ground, uh, groundwater table by holding the uh, groundwater soil. These are things that are invisible to us and we do not come across these things, but they're very much happening. So in this particular case of uh, Molem National Park, the project will cut through the forest reserves. But, and what is the issue if it cuts through the forest reserves, you may ask? What it will do is uh, destroy 70,000 trees on the way, which have long stood there for uh, hundreds of years. And it is important, very important that we have, we have older trees uh, for a lot of for a lot of scientific scientific reasons in in the national uh, in the forest reserves, and uh, it in interrupts plant animal interactions and seed dispersion. It increases the mortality rate of wild animals and movement rate of wild mammals, reptiles. Uh, so when you have a car going through through the forest, of course uh, it will you will end up affecting the animals around. And uh, it will also lead to soil erosion, leading to river pollution, as in when the soil erodes, the fertile topsoil erodes into the rivers, polluting the river, in turn making the topsoil as well unfertile. So all of this adversely affects the stability of the ecosystem in the forest. And over the long haul, what it will affect to, even though we might not see it immediately over probably 10 to 10 to 20 years, what is expected is that the temperature in Goa will increase and the heat waves will be an issue, will be a, will cause problems. Right now, Goa is a celebrated tourist place, and uh, this is what this is the fate that we are looking into because the project has been sanctioned currently, sadly. And uh, the Madhav Gadgil report, uh, you might have come across this uh, particular issue as well. Environmental Impact Assessment Act has been amend amended in India from the central government right now. Um, and one of the reasons why EIA becomes important is it has relaxed the um, norms that the corporates have to follow to, to conduct these, conduct these uh, projects huge construction projects and uh, environmental impact assessment basically gives an account of what does it mean environmentally for species, for uh, for our terrain and flora and fauna and how does it af adversely affect humans. So one of the reports that is quite famous is from 2011, the Madhav Gargil report, which, which has clearly declared Goa as, you know, an environmentally sensitive area that taking up any developmental, large-scale developmental activity will be detrimental. But it is happening anyways. And another another issue that the report has been right about is the 2018 floods that happened in the Western Guards. These are the images from the landslides and the floods that the Kerala and Karnataka region had to face uh, during that time. So these are the environmental repercussions that we are looking at when we ignore the natural environment in the name of development. So forest fires is one um, aspect that's recently gaining light because of the 2019 for uh, fires in the Amazon forests. And recently we had forests in, in our own land, in, in, uh, in Meister, right? And in California, because of the heat waves, forest fires are of natural cause. It is a naturally occurring uh, phenomenon but the dry in the dry seasons it is quite common but because of the rise in global temperature the effects of the effects of uh, forest fire and the impact the intensity it is having has increased uh, increased a lot and most of the fires that are being caused is because of human actions it is either on purpose as in to uh, you know maybe they have an agricultural land that they want to uh, 
they, they want to regulate so they set fires and it it is controlled fires but sometimes they tend to get out of control or it could also be by accident um that forests are set on fire so just to give an idea of what region of the world have these occurrences commonly you can see that it is mostly located in the equatorial region because of the uh, because of the much heat gain and although like i mentioned even though it is a naturally occurring thing it's when its intensity increases the the its effect on global warming also also increases so let's take a look at how 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 much the temperature has increased and and at what scale it is going currently um uh, mr sankashan could you play the uh, video from link 2 for me please uh yes uh, yes ma'am we'll play it in a moment thank you uh i shall stop sharing my screen on yeah yeah, yeah. sorry you can un- you can mute yourself for this chimney sure ma'am so this particular video is sourced from nasa website uh, on a study conducted by uh, giss institute on change in surface air temperature of the atmosphere over years so right now we are in this particular phase and this is where we are headed we can see a global temperature increase in about almost 2 degrees from 1900s and this that is how the scene would look around the end slide is how the scene would look somewhere around 2000s so in another 90 years 80 years or so in fact we we will we will be facing uh, if we keep going at this pace a major increase in global temperature and what is it that uh, we this is a this has become a fact this is no more an instigation and uh, what are the repercussions that we can expect because of this so the major ones would be the polar bears would go extinct and the water supply will get affected and the rare species as it is already happening will definitely go extinct if the temperature rises by another 2 2 degrees if you can focus on the left bottom corner of the presentation you will you will see that what you will see what the impacts of a uh, climate crisis can be on the globe um even without a global rise in temperature we are facing a pandemic which has affected our lives immeasurably nobody expected this coming so uh, all of these things all of these occurrences because of a uh, climate effect happen out of the blue uh, it's it would probably seem like we did not see it coming but all the while all of us have been contributing it knowingly or unknowingly so what are the solutions that we can take um one of the major causes for current situation is our dependence on resources mostly till date we have been depending on non renewable resources again we are going back to eds and science textbooks here if you can recall um from the participants and if anybody can uh, mention any 
effects of uh, these things if anybody cares to venture and answer uh, i'd be welcome anybody if you'd like to contribute to the presentation right now students uh, you can unmute and uh, interact uh, with the speaker hello um, i'm sure these are topics that you have come across and there are no wrong answers here we are all here to learn and grow together so it is okay uh, I, I, you guys you are people who are bubbling with ideas in your head please don't shy away please uh, voice out your opinions and answers hello uh, we will keep the question and answer at the end of the session sir sure, ma'am sir sure, sure. all right like uh, the common resources that we know of from the non renewable end are the petroleum petrol coal so the basic difference between these two is that renewable resources are replenishable they do not end the supply of renewable resources is endless and in case of non renewable resources there is a limited supply and from the planet and we have only one planet to live in our dependency so far in all of the products that we use and our life activity mostly has been depending on non renewable resources and it is high time that we switch to renewable resources because in search of these non renewable resources is how we have plundered our environment destroying the rainforests and uh mining activities to mine bauxite and aluminum so these have had repercussions in terms of deforestation like i mentioned before no, loss in natural vegetation flora and fauna when we do switch to renewable resources however what we will be doing is we can maintain and take look after these natural resources because fortunately our planet heals heals herself quite well where if we give enough time time and resources uh, and distance for uh, na natural places like the forests it it is capable of replenishing and rejuvenating meanwhile if we depend on renewable resources like solar wind and uh, tidal energies geothermal energies we are very much capable of of turning the situation around although the, this shift cannot be expected immediately uh, even in a year or two this is a gradual shift that we need to look into and as engineers and our uh, you know people, young minds who are responsible of uh, de development of nation nation in the future we need to work towards these technologies and majorly what will happen when we shift to renewable resources is we'll be reducing the carbon footprint of the products that we use a day to day uh, usage of products like it could be your pen or your toothbrush or your car everything has a uh, aspect uh, attached to it called carbon footprint so let's get into what it exactly is so that we can better understand how we personally can globally impact our and regulate ourselves in terms of how we how to support uh, environmental betterment so carbon footprint moment yeah carbon footprint is a mark you leave on the environment not with your feet but with the action that releases carbon so you might not re realize it or uh, every action you do when you buy a toothbrush or you, when you buy a packet of snack it has a, a certain amount of energy that has gone into its production so that energy is Uh, accounted for in terms of the amount of carbon or greenhouse gases that is released into the atmosphere so uh, the more fuel and the more energy that a particular product has taken for its production the more its carbon footprint so every like i mentioned before everything that we use we are all on our electronic devices right now our laptops our mobile phones everything has a carbon footprint which um, let's take a classic example of a car Uh, which is a common commodity nowadays so car emits carbon monoxide uh, and it pollutes the environment so the carbon footprint of the car is not just the carbon that is emitted while it's functioning but also while uh, it starts from the stage where 
the production of car begins and the extraction of fuel that it uses to run begins. So if you can go in the cycle from top left corner of the screen, that represents the extraction of oil mining, mining the fuel. And then you, the next step would be transporting the uh, crude oil into the manufacturing unit, petroleum manufacturing unit. So even the transportation consumes fuel, thereby emitting greenhouse gases. So that also adds to the carbon footprint. And then the processing in the factory itself is a is quite an intensive process, which is very energy extensive. So <clears throat> that also gets added to the carbon footprint. And then there's transportation of the fuel into the petrol bunks that there's carbon footprint involved there again. And then your car is fueled up and ready to go. But we only spoke about the fuel right here. The production of car itself is a process. So the carbon footprint of using a car becomes immense. So similarly, for the production and usage of any little thing in today's modern world has a carbon footprint to it. In, uh, in cave, cave days where, you know, in Neolithic era, where we did not use many industrial things where such uh, such inventions did not happen and industries were not set up. This problem, problem did not exist. Caveman was very guilt-free living his life. But uh, in modern days, because we are, our lives have evolved with these in innovations, every aspect of our lives involves carbon footprint. And not just... Uh, not just mechanical things or synthetic and man-made things, even natural things like produ food producers, even an apple can have carbon footprint when you import it from outside, wherein, wherein say it is produced somewhere in, somewhere in Kashmir, which is mostly our source of apple, even in, within the country, it has to travel a distance till it reaches southern part of India, right? So the fuel, fuel cost will get attached to the carbon footprint of the apple that we are consuming. So essentially what we're trying to, what we're, I'm trying to tell you here is that each one of us amounts to a certain amount of carbon emission every day, day in, day out. Uh, and it is inevitable. Um, it is something that we have, we have, um, we've adapted to and we've evolved with. So only thing we can do is reduce the carbon footprint. Like I mentioned before, the carbon footprint of a car is humongous. But when we substitute that with an alternate option of uh, public transport or something that does not use fossil fuel like a bicycle, we're essentially making an eco-friendly choice right there. So that is how we can consciously reduce uh, reduce our own carbon footprint. And another aspect of uh, carbon footprint is how far the product has transported to reach you. So one obvious solution for this is go local. Uh, consume local pr products, like it may it may be fruits or your clothing, any anything. So so these these are the steps that we can personally take to ensure ensure that we do not cause more ill effects to our planet. But in today's time, we are so much dependent on uh, products from multinational companies. Like we can you know, at least once in a while, at least we've used one of these products from the brands that have been mentioned here. And each one of these products has a huge carbon footprint because of the factories they've set up and the, and the resources they plunder. And they are mostly not held accountable. And uh, that is a whole systemic issue that uh, let's not get into that. So let's take a look at the production, how the production happens or where these products are coming from, all the products that we use in day-to-day -day life. So it starts from, uh, it starts from the you know, left part of your screen. That is, it starts from sourcing natural resources which is just a fancy word for destruction and mining. Because we, uh, to make something, say a plastic bottle, we do need crude oil, that is how it is made. And we do need to dig deep into Earth's, Earth's surfaces to extract the, extract the oil. 
and then there is the next process the manufacturing process and then the uh, whole shopping scene where consumerism and shopping has become a you know a fashion statement these days so and then the usage of the material itself um is quite minimal in fact the products in today's days are designed in such a way that they have very little lifetime in the sense that they do not they do not last that long so that is that is the key that consumerism runs on that they keep you buying new things because if you take we, we all use mobile phones right and uh, they say even in the market they say it is a big thing if the mobile last outlast two or three years of and you know it's they say it's a great thing but why we have had mobile phones previously which have functioned well and and our technology is so advanced that we are capable of making industries are capable of making technology which is long lasting but uh, that is a choice that the producers make to keep the consumerism going the particular uh, the third arrow that's the golden arrow that is the shopping aspect is what runs the economy and um uh, of 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 the world so they keep you buying and they keep producing new things and at what cost is something that we have not looked into deeply so what happens at the end of the life what happens to our uh, mobile phones and our ear phones our toothbrushes at the end of after its usage because we probably don't use any of this for more than 2 or 3 years all of it goes to landfills this is a common sight sadly today in today's in today's scenario every city has a dump yard it's become a norm so and obviously none of us like going to these places but we are somewhere we are contributing to these things and it is time that we take responsibility because the repercussions are very evident and if we like they say um we have not as much as we have in, inherited this earth from our forefathers mostly we are borrowing future from our children so is this the future that we want to leave our children with so what are the tiny steps that we can take to ensure that we are more conscious about our consumption so any product that you do use personally you can make sure about make a point to get to know how it is produced in the sense that just to know where your product comes from uh i'm sure mo- uh, most of us probably don't know where our toothbrushes come from or what goes into our toothpaste that we use so these are things that um uh, that we are consuming but have no idea where they arrive from so and um the consumer mm-hmm. market has turned these products so essential to us that uh we cannot imagine lives without you know brushing our teeth every day it's become a thing but there are alternatives we have lived a, a consumer free lifestyle a few centuries ago even a century ago and our nation india especially has a lot of in, uh valuable intelligent information that that uh, we haven't tapped into so what are the adverse effects of use uh that as uh, consumerism is causing today uh it's killing marine life and pollutes our ocean and um uh, most of the products say that they are recyclable but only very tiny percentage of that is is being recycled and it causes very very bad ill health effects as well can we change this can we shift from this and if yes what would be the alternative since we are so used to using all these products we need alternatives for it because we cannot be expected to you know just say no we will not use these products because we have we are so you know we have lived with these things for so long so the alternate is that we use that we are conscious about how the production of these things happen so the current economy or production line that follows is the linear economy where the chain goes from natural resources to waste and everything that happens in between is its production usage and disposal uh so we are essentially converting natural resources into waste at the end of the day 
what we can look into is a circular economy where we look at an economy which is which does not have an open end but a closed loop if we recall uh, again from the pr presentation earlier the natural systems always are in cycle uh, there is it is not a linear system because if if you take consider the case of water cycle there is always a place that water goes and uh, and reforms it does not go to waste anywhere so that is something that we humans also need to adapt in uh, our own lives so there are uh, essentially two two ways of uh, this circular economy being possible one is organic recycling using biodegradable and compostable products as in for example if we can substitute our plastic toothbrushes with a bamboo brush which will decompose eventually because uh, trust me it won't make a much it won't make much of a difference when you're brushing your teeth if you're holding a plastic or a bamboo in fact uh, i personally made the switch and i i feel happy that the, the brush won't end up in a landfill so i uh, making biodegradable and compostable using those products can help greatly reduce the amount of waste production that ha that is happening currently and uh, another thing another technical aspect that we all can focus is mechanical recycling so when we have waste any product is you're done using the product instead of throwing it out we need to consider if we can reuse it in your own in the premise of your own home if there is a possibility and a place for it to go if not then there is recycling always but that is not the case for most of the products so what we can make a conscious choice about is not to use products that are not recyclable which again becomes very difficult we again we have to make a choice based on situations and another option is upcycling uh what i mean by upcycling is um upcycling is where you extend the life of the product after its usage say a uh, tetra pack fruity pack uh, you know all the all of these milk cartons come in the uh, these tetra pack layers of aluminum plastic paper these are non recyclable but we can find an alternative use for it make products currently in construction industry especially we're making uh, roofing sheets out of them to extend the tetra pack's life from 4 years to 25 years again it is not the best of solution but it is still the best of the bad situation that we can make so uh, what we can personally change is this particular aspect where where we consciously choose what we use um um uh dr deepa if if you could excuse me for one moment there yeah, is yeah some... yes yeah. yes you can take uh students you are supposed to ask questions and make this session more interactive no so it will be uh, it should not be like one sided uh, you should participate this uh, is ex exclusively uh, arranged for you people Rudresh, uh, you can unmute and tell that to her uh, by yourself. Rudresh yes, is there, no? Instead of typing, you can uh, stop and interact. Uh, good morning, Deepa, ma'am. Yes, I will. Good morning. Make... Good morning. Ah, uh, see, uh, make... uh, uh, they expect some questions from you so that uh, they will also get encouragement to continue, right? So if they ask something in between, you should interact, and it will make it more interesting. Definitely, ma'am. Ah. Uh. All right. Uh, uh, Chinmayi, ma'am, Rudresh uh, uh, is uh, wanting to interact in the yes. session. So yes, ma'am. Yes, Mr. Rudresh. Please. Uh, that usage of bamboo to press uh, yes. was quite excellent because I'm not heard of it. The oh. day we start with the brush, right? I wasn't heard of this product before, and this is something okay. excellent. I think. Thank you for sharing that idea with us. Add that you're here with us in the presentation, Rudresh. Then, um, yeah, um, I hope that this presentation will have similar impacts. Uh, Swamya, yes. okay, I guess that was an. Uh, shall I continue with the presentation? Yeah, yeah, please. Yes. Ma'am, uh, you will have another ten minutes, ten fifteen minutes to wind up this. Uh, 
talk, the first talk. Sure, ma'am. Uh, yeah. Thank you. All right. Uh, Chinmay, ma'am, I actually had a question. Uh, yes, go ahead. Hello? Please ask, uh, Swamidhi. Uh, ma'am, like the order from Zomato Swidhi and every like, food outlets. Right. Chinmay, please mute yourself when we ask the question. Okay, one moment. Now, I think the noise isn't from my end, ma'am. Yeah, yeah Saunyadi, please uh, continue. So, ma'am, uh, 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 Saunyadi, if we could check if you're logged in from multiple devices, that tends to happen when you do that. If you could mute yourself or distance one device, it would help. Or you could type in the question. Since we have a time limit here, I will answer the question at the end of the session, probably. Yeah? Does that uh, work? Some other for you, you just log out of the multiple devices if you have logged in. And by the end of the session, you can ask the question. And if, the, if you have the same problem, you can type in your question and ask the same thing. Yes, Mr. Chinmay, you can continue. Yes. Oh, sorry. All right. Um, so, okay. Uh, let's resume with one very important, not one particular event, but industrial revolution and how it has powered consumerism and how it has you know catered to consumerism so currently we are in fourth industrial revolution the first one was in around before 1800s in 18th century when um, the steam engine was invented and cars were a new things and the second industrial revolution marks the assembly line production which is which was uh, crucial in terms of mass mass production and around third industrial revolution uh, the production became automated where you did not even need an assembly line the machines would take care of it and currently we are in the middle of fourth industrial revolution as in uh, so where we are we have artificial artificial intelligence guiding the content that we are consuming and uh, things like that and all our devices are connected via cloud there is so much automation happening. So that is where we are at. And the deeper we go into technology and industrial revolution, what we have seen is this is in the production region that this, if we recall the uh, economic setup, it is in the make region of the linear economy that we have these advent, advents and innovations happening. But what we have fallen behind is with the waste management, the end of the cycle. So that has resulted in, again, I come back to this point, waste management and waste disposition. One of the pressing issues is landfills and why landfills is a concern for everybody and we need to find better alternatives to avoid this issue is because it pollutes the very groundwater that we most of us depend on. Not every place is fortunate enough to have a fresh water source or a running flowing water source. So in a lot of places we depend on groundwater. And if, God forbid, it is placed near an industrial area where there is leaching into the ground, into the water table, we, uh, when we dig bore wells deep enough to extract water, we what we get is polluted water, and uh, and this is has a very harmful effects on on the planet and your own personal health that it directly affects us. So what we can do is. Uh, this particular act, which now we see that even the administrative uh, part is, you know, sort of looking into these days, fortunately, where they're advising you to segregate wastes. So there is first basic segregation of organic and non-organic, which is decomposable and not decom non-decomposable. When something is decomposable, Mother Earth will directly take care of it because because it can go back to earth and become soil and enrich enrich the planet again. But when it is um, non-synthetic -synth products like metals or plastics and paper, 
we need to be careful as to where it goes at the end of its life cycle so segregating and repurposing and recycling these products becomes very important uh, to avoid the situation and and one thing that we do need to remember is that we are interdependent as much as we see uh, we don't come across wildlife or domestic life uh, our ecosystem is interlinked and that is how the whole earth sustains if there is some sort of uh, factory pollution happening in ha halfway across the world our country gets affected as well and it is vice versa so we have a global responsibility to be responsive ourselves and um, that so far we've extensively covered the environmental impacts of using uh, products which are produced by big corporates or you know industrial products basically it could it could be as minute as your you know zomato packaging that samyudhi was mentioning was trying and be it even the toothbrush uh, when we go local as in when we depend on um, products that are made in our immediate surroundings uh, it has a considerable socio economic impact on improving our own uh, surroundings as well so uh, there is a concept called 100 mile economy where if you shop if you are able to shop and consume products from in and around you uh, which are local to you um, you will uh, you will have a considerable impact on the regional economy in the sense that uh, a classic example could be again uh, our favorite thing snacks right um, you okay lace on kurkure is also chips and your local uh, hot chips place is also chips but when you are buying lace the money that you are contributing is going to the big manufacturers in the sense that people who are already rich these people these corporates are extremely wealthy and uh, they they keep the process running and keep you on their products products like i mentioned before uh, so that they keep getting wealthy if say you choose not to take lace or kurkure or you know all of these packed food and you go for a local local shop and buy hot chips like hot potato chips who will you contributing your money to you will be contributing to somebody from your own place and you will be helping them make a living so these are the small conscious changes that will this is just one tiny case the impact of this can scale from clothes where like we all love fashion right we all buy from uh, h&m forever 21 zara so these are big corporates what if we replace this with local materials like things that are made locally like khadi uh, that again has an that ha has its economic impact so these are the conscious choices that we can make so this is a, a comical representation of what we are doing in our mm. and um, there's an uh, one more concept that i'd like to address here is green washing uh, so today uh, the term sustainability itself has been used in various senses and uh, we have a lot of green products coming up right like organic food and all of these things so at the same time you have to be conscious about what you are consuming because the labels will say green product outright you know to showcase but uh, we need to think for ourselves is this product really green uh one uh, somebody's microphone is on could you please mute yourself thank you so fiji for example what is happening essentially here is they have been given a fake green cred credential to deceive customers into believing that their product helps the natural world whereas the bottled Uh, the label on the bottle neglects to mention that water bottles are one of the most detrimental products and one something that is avoidable if we consciously make a choice to carry a bottle of water with you like a metal bottle or a reusable bottle bottled water can absolutely be avoided and in fact anywhere you go in uh, where the land and our ground water is not polluted you can directly consume ground water with basic filtration and bottled water is com is completely avoidable and uh, what is shocking is what we see in weddings today like every person has half a liter of water and 
you know nobody really completely drinks it and it goes to waste these are situations which are completely avoidable in weddings you can replace it with with uh, metal cups and you can wash it and reuse it again so these are things that uh, that are that happen right in front of you you are made to believe that these are green products but essentially when you look into the economics environmental impacts of these things they are not so green so this is just a tiny example of green washing what the big corporates are doing is just labeling labeling their products left and right green which which really isn't fair on uh, you know on their part or consumers part so as consumers we need to be conscious enough to take a call on what we what we buy and what we don't because we still have the power as to where we contribute money into what we are putting our spending our fortune in so let's take a look at innovations and sustainable technologies and possibility here i'd like to mention one very beautiful example of uh, a dutch solar designer that i come, came across uh, her name is marhan van obel and uh, the one thing she believed in is that each this is the statement of uh, her driving force each hour the earth receives enough sunlight to provide to provide uh, the whole planet with sufficient energy for an entire year so she believes that every hour we are receiving so much energy from the sun right so this is something that we need to tap into is what she believes so um, she has come up with uh, designs for this particular window that you see it's called a current window uh, so the, uh, if you can see the image on your right side there's a there's a phone charging at the at the cell level at the uh, on the on the platform right so the whole window is an elect, is a solar panel the tinted glass window is a solar panel and the there are electric cells in there so this is a kind of innovation that we would we want to we should be doing in order to have a more uh, you know sustainable and eco friendly eco friendly future or what we this is what we sh- this is the technology that we should leave our next generation with and uh, a few other innovations that uh, she has come up with is the current table again with the similar uh, concept where the table top is completely made of solar cells and you can plug in you can plug in your phone and uh, charge so in this particular case you are not relying on any of the uh, fossil fuels you do not have to have nuclear reactors producing high energy things for you to get electricity here it's you are tapping into the sunlight which is a renewable resource to to cater to your own needs so this is this is another thing that uh, amar khan has come up with as well it is called a power plant so it functions as a solar cell uh, the the case that you see on the left top corner is the is transparent but it is a solar panel solar panel which is transparent and produces electricity and what you see on the right are urban farming pods where there's water running through the pipes and uh, there are greens growing inside inside these pods which can be consumed so this is one innovation which addresses uh, multiple issues at the same time uh you know it addresses the issue of shortage in food and enables urban farming as well as uh you know production of electricity so this is just one example of the kind of innovation that we are looking into and that we need to have a better future and um, yes thank you for listening patiently and uh, yeah this is the end of the presentation thank Mom, you so much i have a question to ask yeah sure uh, how to bring sustainability in construction in order to reduce uh, industry's impact on the environment okay so the next presentation by architect nitin m is completely focused on this particular issue so i think you will find a lot of answers then so stick on you will find very elaborate answers then i can offer you in the short time i have right now hope that's fine yes ma'am sure thank you uh, i had a question yes jayesh uh so i'm basically if we consider india so there are huge private players like ola and tesla who have entered into the electric vehicles field 
So okay. generally, this huge amount of power through renewable resources is not feasible going going to the low efficiency. But if the demand is not met, it would hamper the image of an Atmanirbhar Bharat that we wish to create. So how exactly do we balance between the image of Atmanirbhar Bharat and sustainability? So um, in the current context, if you see, there will be industries which will be thriving. But what is the working principle behind the industry is what we need to look into. So what Tesla is essentially doing is making electric cars, which we are fortunately transitioning towards. And thereby, what we need to consider is a cumulative effect of what is happening on a global scale. Right. So if it is doing something good, uh, of course, there will be the way we have formed our lifestyle today. We we, if you ask everybody on the globe to live without a car, which it, it is not going to be possible. So you, we have to we have to strike a balance with lesser of the evil. Even to make the batteries of an electric car, you have to mine lithium, which is which is you know which is the issue right now in talk of the town. Right. But um, that's where you have to take a call as to what corporate or what company is doing innovations in the right direction because new things will keep coming up but in what direction is it going is what is important is what i believe i hope that answers your question thank you thank you excuse me ma'am yes suhas ma'am which are the courses that which mainly focuses on the sustainability on sustainability as such um so since i come from an architecture and construction background uh, there yes, are sustainable architecture design courses and even in engineering there are environmental design courses that you can pursue after your undergraduation or you can work in in these corporations even if there are no uh, you know curriculum like mainstream cur curriculums dedicated to these courses what we uh, even me personally i learned with experience when i only when i went into the field and worked I got to know about these things and I was exposed to this entire world of what is happening. It was sort of an eye opener. So even if there is no conventional course as such, uh, you can do internships in places which are working in these lines, you know, apply for places like this and, you know, enter competitions like the one that NIE physics department organized and have these conversations with more people. So you can look into internships, I would suggest, to get a more practical experience uh, if you do, in case you don't find a formal training course for, of, for your stream. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Thank you, thank you, Ms. Chinmayi. I remember a song, a famous song from Michael Jackson, Heal the world, make it a better place for you and for everybody. So that's what exactly we need to think about. And each may, may it be an engineer, may it be a doctor, may it be a technician. Everybody and every citizen has to focus on uh, the eco-friendly uh, habits uh, so that we spare future for our uh, you know, the future kids also. And uh, it was indeed a, uh, an excellent presentation, uh, which uh, definitely I hope uh, it might have inspired many of them to use the bamboo brush or the bamboo straws uh, or in whatever way they can contribute uh, for the uh, uh, the nature. And also, uh, she showed uh, the excellent examples of uh, the innovations uh, that that is eco-friendly, for example, the solar uh, charging or uh, the, the other things. So you being the engineers, and then probably after five years, you'll be into the profession. And you can also be, uh, I mean, you uh, be creative uh, in contributing things like this. And this is definitely an inspiration to everybody. Uh, thank you, Ms. Chinmayi, once again. And uh, now it's time for the announcement of the winners of uh, the national level competition, Best Out of Waste. And for those who do not know in the audience, we had arranged a national level competition, Best Out of Waste. So we had asked them to create some models which are uh, uh, which, uh, using some technology and uh, make it more applicable. So, based on some criteria, Ms. Chinmayi has judged it and uh, she is about to announce the winners now. Over to you, Ms. Chinmayi. Okay, thank you, Dr. Deepa. Um, so, we had very, uh, very interesting entries for the best out of waste uh, context, contest. And um, I'd like to mention a few criteria based on which uh, I had to make the judgment. Uh, well, first would be the functionality and originality of the idea. 
and then the uh, practical model and its application in real time world and its relevance to common public um, uh, how feasible and how what impact it has on everyday you know common people is very uh, important and the scale of the impact scale of the impact that the recycling and the reusage of that particular waste material has so um based on this i'd like to announce the winners right now so the first uh, sorry okay let me go from third place so the third place goes to vignesh v for radiographic film recycler um dr deepa will you be uh, seeing the videos later yeah 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 uh, we can do that or uh, after yeah. announcing all the third prize video he is about to uh, showcase now just Shall wait I for a moment sure yeah <laughs> Hello everyone. My name is Vignesh BSC Radiography, and this is my friend. My name is Asim Kumar BSC Radiography Third Year. We are from School of Applied Health Sciences, Punaga Mission Research Foundation, Delhi University, from Salem, Tamil Nadu. Say about the radiographic film recycler. The radiographic film recycler is a machine which we are used to recycle the radiographic film. Because nowadays the radiographic film is a big cause of biomedical waste, which is non-degradable waste. So by recycling them, we can reduce the non-degradable plastic waste by radiographic film. Say so about the concept. The concept of the radio radiographic film recycler is erasing the upper four layers of a radiographic film. Radiographic film is made up of four layers: base, adhesive, emulsion, super coat. When the electrons uh, uh, fall upon the film, it forms the image with the aluminium halide crystals, and after it forms the lattice image. We are going to remove that aluminium halide crystals and to and extract the polyester sheet from the radiographic film. And this polyester sheet will be recycled by recoating of silver halide crystals. By this, we can recycle recycle the silver film and the Dust collected from the erasing of the silver halide crystal, which it, is used to recover the silver from the dust. We have shown here the dust. So, what are the benefits? The main benefit of this is to reduce the biomedical waste by radiographic film and to recycle the radiographic film. And mainly, it is a chemical-free method, purely mechanical. The method is to say. MRI sheet roller, which used to erase the upper layer of the X-ray film, and it is the cheapest method if I recycle one, and, and it is eco-friendly uh, to the environment. You can see the image here. Now we are going to see about the radiographic recycler film recycler model. In this method, we are using the MRI roller, the MRI sheet is this which is used to grade or erase the upper coating of an X-ray film, and it get gets polished, and the polyester sheet is uh, comes out as a result. This is first time recycling. After recycling, there will be a mark in the X-ray film that recycled first time, and then in second for second time, the quality of the polyester sheet will, sheet will be lowered. So we make two films to recycle. In that method, we insert one film above and one film below, and as is, as, as is said, the film get a, the co film coating gets erased, and two polyester sheet layer were merged into one polyester layer by use of adhesive, and as a result, we get the new polyester sheet layer, which will be sent to radiographic film industry for recoating and reusing, and the additionally we get the. the Silver halide crystal powder in which it can be the silver recovered. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Vignesh is here amongst us. Congratulations, Vignesh. Uh, would you uh, like to uh, talk a word, uh, share a word with us? Vignesh. Thank you. Yeah. 
Ma'am, hearing. Yeah, 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 yeah. We are hearing. Where are you from? Which place you are from, and what are you studying in? Ma'am, uh, I am from uh, School of Allied Health Science, Unagam Science Research Foundation, Salem. Uh, what are you studying in? I am studying in Red Eye. Where are you, ma'am? Third year. Okay. How how are you feeling now? You got the third prize. I think he has some uh, network issues. Uh, see, he is from Salem, and he has participated in the video competition. Congratulations, Vignesh, and uh, keep doing it and uh, be creative. Thanks, thanks for participating. Thank and we will contact you. we will contact you how to proceed with uh, in uh, receiving the award. Okay. Okay, okay, ma'am. Thank you, ma'am. Uh, Miss Chinmayi, can you announce the second place? Uh, students get inspired from these videos. You can also uh, be creative and uh, uh, use your uh, research mind uh, in, in in creating the uh, uh, models like this. Yes, ma'am. So um, the second place goes to Shaheen Afshana for a handmade torch from waste bottle. The video will be played of hers. Shaheen, uh, you can unmute and talk. Okay. Many congratulations. Uh, indeed, a uh, uh, very creative model you have. Uh, can you unmute yourself and talk? Good morning, ma'am. Good morning, good morning. Many congratulations. Thank you, ma'am. I am so happy, ma'am. Uh, where are you from? I am from Chennai, ma'am. I am studying second BSc Physics, ma'am. Oh, very good, very good. So, have you been doing such kinds of models, uh, or it's only for the competition you have uh, tried it out? No, ma'am. No, ma'am. In in college competitions, I'll do, ma'am. Very I'll good. Keep, keep going. It's really inspiring for others as well. 
many congratulations uh, we will contact you thank soon. you ma'am thank you ma'am thank you so much ma'am thanks for being the part of this program okay yes mr inmay yes uh, congratulations shaheen and vignesh uh, very interesting concepts and vignesh we'd like to see the radiographic film recycle you know in function and upscale it looks very interesting i hope you carry it forward um all right so the first place goes to dinesh kumar for electronic waste music system many congratulations uh, mr dinesh the video will be played soon ramu playing your video just give a moment Hello. many congratulations <laughs> um so the audio is not uh, audible we are checking out the problem okay uh, sorry there is some problem with the audio just uh, go ahead with the video Uh, Dinesh, uh, you can just say uh, along with the video what you have done about so that the students get to know what is it about. What is this model about? Ma'am, electronic waste, ma'am. Just explain in a one or two sentences so that they understand what have you done. Since the audio is not there, you can explain them in few sentences. Ma'am, sorry, ma'am, I am not. Uh, English speaking. Okay, okay, fine. It's okay. Okay. Uh, connected them through a Bluetooth circuit in order to produce music, uh, to create a music outlet. That is the whole uh, project. for me what was most impressive was because electronic waste is something that uh, is very tricky to handle and to be able to use that uh, i believe can have a very uh, you know large scale impact if we are able to make a device using these separate components that they have pieced together to produce music we have our own sound system uh, quickly made so that was uh, a very interesting aspect of uh, dinesh's uh, project right here so i i wish everybody could hear the you know music that came out at the end uh it was quite interesting so congratulations dinesh i hope i explained your concept correctly thank you Con- congratulations dinesh and where are you from which place you are from i'm from karur ma'am from india okay uh, it's it, it's a, a very interesting model you have worked on Uh, as ms chinmay pointed out uh, electronic waste uh, management is very important at, uh, at this uh, uh, time and you have done a beautiful model and it's very inspiring and keep doing such models and we con- keep contributing to the uh, research as well all the very best to you thank you uh on behalf of uh, department of physics i i would like to thank ms chinmay for her involvement and uh, spending time in uh, going through these uh, videos uh, and judging it uh, and thanks once again for being part of this program it was really very interesting uh, topic that uh, you have uh, spoken of and we will be in touch with you in future also and uh, we would like to have you offline in our college whenever you are free uh, thanks ms chinmay once again Uh, thank you very much dr deepa for the opportunity uh, for giving me this opportunity to, to share the knowledge and uh, yeah it it was a very interesting experience i i hope it was effective for you guys and you guys took something out of it thank you okay now it's time for the second uh, uh, speech 
by architect Nathan MS. Uh, are you there, sir? I just hand it over to him. He'll uh, start off with the second session. So till he uh, joins, uh, students, would you like to uh, tell your feedback about the first session? So in uh, one or two minutes, uh, he will be joining uh, for the second session. Excuse me, ma'am. Ma'am? Yes, Rashmi. Hello. You can, you can speak to Rashmi. Yes. Right. It's not audible. And Sayos, open that video with some other players. Your audio is breaking. Uh, it, yeah, it's not clear. Could you type in the message in case your signal is not great? Like, uh, we can open the video using some other media player. Sorry, I didn't get your question. Hello, Rashmi. Mama. She wants to watch the video, the oh, audio, the first okay. prize video. We're trying out. Give give a moment. We, we'll try our best to show you that. All right, ma'am. Ma'am, can you oh. please share those videos separately? Yes, yes, we will do it. In the YouTube channel itself, we'll share the link so that you can watch it. All the the best three videos will be showcased in the I mean, the links will be shared in the YouTube channel. We'll upload it. Yes, ma'am. The departmental YouTube channel, and we'll give, we'll share the link also. Students, don't log out. We'll be having the second session in a few moments. Uh, will be joining us in probably uh, another 10 minutes. Hello, ma'am. Uh, yes, Samidhi, you want to ask uh, the question? Uh, you can hear me clearly, right? Yes, yes, now you go. I'll, I'll just ask uh, Ms. Chinmay to come back. Are you there, Ms. Chinmay? Uh, you have uh, a question? Yes, Dr. Deepa. You have a question. Uh, Chinmay, ma'am, uh, do you think the Paris Climate Agreement is good enough for tackling climate change? Uh, what climate element? Uh, Paris Climate, Paris climate Agreement. agreement. Um, so the agreements are being made, but uh, the actions is what matters, right? Uh, currently, and as far as I know, India is doing good in that. But so like yes. the developed countries aren't going, like, going exactly. that good. So as the current situation stands, you um, so India has been taking steps, right? Establishing uh, many. Solar solar power plants and uh, you know establishing electric cars, car units across the country. So, uh, but that's the thing about environmental issue um, because the world is so interconnected. It is vital that all of us act, even if it is a tiny act towards tiny step towards the uh, more sustainable future. It is important that all the countries make that, you know. Uh, that is where the the real effects can be seen because the pollution that is being caused, like I, like I mentioned before, it can be felt here as well. So the it it is it's break the issue is not reserved to India or US or uh, Russia. 
the issue knows no uh, national boundaries or patriotism none of that thing so um i suppose it is because not all the countries have taken effective measures even if our country is not all the countries are so that is a major uh factor here especially for paris agree- agreement to be effective i believe so that is my take on it that um, you know it uh, it needs to be seen more in action globally not just in our country but we it is good that uh, our countries are taking measures towards uh, to in this direction samidip uh, yeah yes ma'am uh, i have another question yes sir actually uh, like uh, i've read that meat like eating meat it's one of the like uh, largest polluters right of one so right. like i i'm a meat lover i i like it <laughs> so right. what should we do about it um so very interesting question thank you um given the whole day i would have introduced all of these topics in the presentation but thank you for taking this up so the thing with meat eating no animal husbandry is one industry that is like that hasn't been spoken about much especially in our indian context because um again coming back to a little bit of biology here when we eat directly eat greens directly we are consuming energy directly when you are eating a particular piece of meat let's say a chicken you have to feed the chicken its entire life and then you eat that chicken in one meal so the amount of energy the amount of water food that goes into feeding that chicken and then you consuming that chicken only 10% of the uh, energy transfer or uh, that's the effective energy that gets transferred into the next uh, higher food chain that's uh, that's basic biology right so that's the issue what is happening globally is that uh, animal husbandry especially in western countries is a big issue because uh, things like uh, uh, beef which are mass produced in factories cows are kept in very uh, horrible horrible situations where uh, you know they have no freedom or life of their own they basically bred to be eaten so such scenarios cause uh, very harmful effects where we are producing and using up a lot of forest area for agriculture you know the uh, areas which were supposed to uh, host host a wa- variety of wildlife is being compromised to create produce for uh, animal husbandry to feed the cows to feed us you know that's how the food chain is going right now so uh, that is the issue with uh, eat meat eating that uh, globally we cannot feed meat to everybody and the rate at, it, at which it is being consumed right now uh, we cannot the planet cannot cater to it and uh, right now there are alternates coming up like uh, synthetic meat where they are using a tissue culture to take one you know a particular tissue from the animal without killing actually killing the animal they are taking one a part of the animal and you know uh, cultivating it in uh, labs and things like that to to produce meat so that uh, that i guess is in one way caters to you know chris gives an alternative for meat lovers like yourself so yeah there are solutions and innovations happening in these lines as well but again um, i suppose it's again 5 to 10 years down the line till we uh, we can avail it i actually have read about synthetic meat like uh, it was introduced in singapore right yeah it it's being introduced in singapore right now yeah in restaurants they are uh, making dish like dishes out of it mm-hmm. yeah so basically we all have to like, try synthetic meat <laughs> probably in the future again um, it really depends on how we have produced the meat itself you know uh, in what environment you know how you know nati koli organic koli is chicken is better than the farm bred because uh, it's consumption wise again there are a lot of ethical layers attached to it which i, l- I wouldn't want to get into but uh, environmentally speaking um, being an omnivore is a natural process for other species as well for so for humans as well but at what rate are we doing it animals don't 
breed and you know breed other animals to consume right so that is where the the human uh, consciousness and creativity has come into place to breed animals so yeah i guess i said wait from your question but yeah i hope that gives you a bit more of clarity yes ma'am thank you uh-huh. thank you hello Uh, Sangeeta, your voice is breaking. Sangeeta, a bit loud. Why is it taking so much time? Am I audible? No? Yeah. Yes, please proceed. Why is it taking so much time for implementing usage of biodiesel and electrical vehicles? Even though they are uh, more advantageous uh, over fossil fuels and fossil fuels. One moment. I'm sorry for that disturbance in the background. So, <clears throat> we have to understand the setup that we are currently living in. Um, it is uh, there are a lot of layers of economics and social aspects connected to the issue of why it is not going forward even though the innovation is there we need to set up effective systems where biodiesel can be sourced and made viable for everybody to use uh, conventional so this sort of innovation needs big investments right it either has to come from uh, administrative bodies like government or uh, which needs a lot of funding or a private organization needs to take up which is capable of providing that fund so unless um, these things are made available for common people through these uh, enterprises it is you know as common people it is difficult for us to you know go and uh, make these things happen especially when it comes to things like biodiesel which requires huge setup so i believe that is one reason the initiatives need to be taken from uh, the end of uh, big enterprises like that hello ma'am um uh, excuse me one hello? second uh, uh, architect nitin uh, professor nitin are you there have you joined yeah go ahead uh, go ahead nidarsha you just ask a question uh, yeah ma'am you explained about uh, various waste management processes but what right. about hazardous waste uh, produced in uh, hospitals uh, right. for that um, now we are using uh, incinerators is there any alternative methods so when it comes to bio waste right the issue is a lot more layered because we always have the risk of the disease or the ailment spreading through various mediums so incinerating is like the most convenient and viable option that we currently have and uh, what we can do with that particular option is mitigate the kind of pollution that is being caused um you know instead of uh, I, i'm i haven't come across personally any other alternative options but uh, there was another entry in the competition which made use of pollution uh, carbon that is extracted from pollution uh, the innovation was uh, pioneered by anirudh sharma again uh, so these are this is something this is uh, innovation incorporated into a problem you know you are giving solution to a particular issue that is existing uh, instead of finding an alternative innovation so i believe for medical waste in particular because it can be very risky to uh, bury it or leave it as such instead of uh, without incinerating it in my personal opinion making use uh, or pollu- finding less polluting options to incinerate it would be better but uh, if there is an alternative innovation coming up that would be great yeah. i hope that answers your question okay ma'am thank you yeah okay i think uh, we can stop at this moment the other questions uh, we'll post her if you just uh, share it with us yeah uh, sure. uh, the first prize uh, the first prize yeah yeah please carry on mr 
yeah you can all i can leave my mail id over here if if hello? you hello am i audible zero mention madakagatha and no people yeah madam you are audible man yes so i'll just leave my email id here uh, if in case anybody wants to get in touch to know about any of these te- uh, techniques like any internships or if you want to carry these concepts forward you can always write to me um tashoma please uh, share your email id we will just share it with the students yeah uh the first prize video will be played uh, right now with, with audio you have solved that principles of electronic waste music system this is transformer it is converted 240 volt to 12 volt next common and called power supply board this is also electronic waste material in the case power supply board connected into amplifying box simultaneously the amplifier connected into bluetooth box because of wireless connectivity the bluetooth connectivity setup carrying 5 volt This Bluetooth box is part of our project. Finally, the output was connected into the speaker box. Now the system is ready to play any kind of music. the major applications and advantages are first one is this is completely eco friendly setup second one is this setup was fabricated by electronic waste components so to reduce the electronic waste components in the way of this kind of recycling process and the last one is to reducing the problems of electric and electronic wastage components finally we got the music at wastage components at short time Thanks for one and all. Thank you. Thank you, Dinesh. Many congratulations once again to all the winners and uh, hope uh, this, these videos have inspired our students as well to involve themselves in such uh, preparation of models and other activities. Uh, so we are going to begin the second uh, uh, speech now uh, since uh, architect nitin is not available due to some network issues uh, mr chinmay will uh, uh, continue with the session about the construction sustainable sustainability in construction uh, yes mr chinmay thank you dr deepa so let me present my screen again all right um okay um so i'll briefly like tell you how my journey as an architect was for you know just to be able to relate to it uh in five years of architecture we have a last year of internship that is the practical training and for four years or so uh, it was mostly studio learning where it was design and there wasn't much exposure towards uh, material that we use uh, in terms of what we build with uh, what we were taught was to use uh, cement and steel which are conventional construction materials so when it was time for my internship 
I it, I fortunately came across this place called Oroville. I hope a lot of you have heard about it. It is in it is related to it is sorry located close to Pondicherry, um, and it is an international township. Uh, the detail I won't get into the details of it. And uh, Sacred Groves is one community where uh, we are trying to build use alternate construction technology and eco-sensitive construction technology and promote community living. So here, uh, I personally got to experience construction firsthand, as in I got to be in the field and build with my own bare hands using natural materials like earth and uh, wood and lime and all of these things. So for me, uh, construction development and architecture most, made most sense when I got in touch with the field and material and the feel of things. So I'm very happy to share this journey with all of you. So just to address the basic principles of what uh, Sacred Grove stands for or how the community uh, is developing because it is an alternate model which can be implemented in other areas like in our cities, Bangalore, Mysore. So it is. it focuses on developing high density housing or medium density housing, which is again relevant to city's context. So that is why the uh, head architect, architect Manu Gopal, he chose a format of row housing, which we usually uh, find here because there's not a lot of space in cities. Uh, the innovation made over there should not stagnate and be relevant only there. It needs to be able to carry forward elsewhere, right? So having a common wall between the houses and um, uh, would would create, would uh, save on space as well. The idea was to incorporate uh, forest and farming within the housing community in the sense that uh, everything that you need to live and sustain sh should be available to you in the community itself. Uh, basically, we are aiming at a self-sustaining community living. So this is a conceptual diagram of how the construction would uh, go ahead. Um, in case you you have a doubt about any technical term that I mentioned, please feel free to stop and ask right then and there because it, it needs to make sense for everybody. All right, so in this conceptual model, we see a, a medium density format of housing where uh, this is a sectional view. If you can see the systems mentioned here, um, we are looking at energy effective building systems, not just construction process, but in the functioning of the system. Because um, when we say a building, uh, it has services attached to it like water, electricity, and uh, we have other things like sewage water going out of the houses and our bathrooms. So all of these are the factors that, uh, that we are taking into consideration while designing itself. So for energy production, we have solar panels on the rooftop. And uh, on top left corner, you can see passive cooling, which is essentially uh, a way of cooling buildings uh, without having energy input. Like usually conventionally what we see outside is we use ACs to cool buildings, right? So, But uh, you might have heard about the ill effects that AC air conditioning has on the planet as well as it's your own health. It is very hazardous. So what we are looking at is design techniques to ensure that the building is being cooled. And of course, there's a lot of planning aspect involved where the, there's greenery situated in front of the house to regulate the immediate surrounding of the houses. And to give you a climate context of Oroville, uh, it, is, it is hot and humid. So in summertime now that the summer is beginning, it gets really hot. Uh, it reaches around 34 to 37 degrees as well. So... Uh, we need to have cooling agents all around. And below, if you can see, there is rainwater harvesting, which is uh, which we aim at depending on because there is uh, we want to be self-reliable in these terms as well, as well as food production units right around the area. So this is the basic concept of the house. And um, this is the set of prototype houses which are built. And these structures are completely made of earth, raw earth construction. Uh, mud and uh, the plastering the white finish you see is made of lime limestone that is so which is actually uh, tra very traditionally if you consider roman construction lime was a very important aspect 
very important cementing agent and uh, the advent of cement happened because of lime lime is a base material for production of cement but again going to carbon footprint the carbon footprint of lime is way 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 less than cement so uh, and again lime has its own uh, thermal properties which are very good for human health as well so and it is also built using timber local timber which is locally sourced as in we need to see what is available in the region so in pondicherry region palm wood and coconut wood is something that is uh, abundantly available so we've used palm and coconut wood here and uh, all the three floors are built with uh, mud construction and and the structure you see in the front are the rainwater harvesting tanks so uh, the idea is that the rainwater which is collected on the rooftop during the monsoon seasons will get collected inside the tank and throughout the year it will be used for miscellaneous activities like bathing and ba bathing washing and for drinking and cooking which is around only 5 liters per per day per person in terms of water consumption we want to rely on precious ground water which is uh, not polluted so this is a bit about planning and creating microclimate since we are uh, think a bit tight on time uh, so the idea here is uh, when we are planning a particular building we create a microclimate around it to regulate the temperature uh, and my Uh, temperature around and atmosphere around the building that is the basic idea here this is a roof plan view of the of the three houses that we saw here this is without any uh, buffers around we say spatially buffers in the sense that it is not directly open but it has these structures like this this is a water tank structure and in the future it is intended to have plants growing on it a layer of uh, soil and vegetation happening around what that does is because plants undergo perspiration there are water vapors which regulate the microclimate and brings down the temperature so that is one planning aspect that uh, we looked into again this is the working section of uh, how the houses would function on the long run where we see from the rooftops we have gutters and pipelines connecting into the water tanks and uh, we want to have proper uh proper soil layers and uh, buffers and create a vegetation on top of the water tank so that it is again it is nice to have greenery around you as well as um, you know it, it it can be a source of food production you can grow banana papaya whatever and on the north end so in the plan uh, the north is on the top and north side of the side gets heated up quite often so this is especially during the summer it gets heated so this is the buffer layer that we have provided in order to reduce the heat gain so these are all planning aspects of the design now let's look into the construction aspect of what the structure is actually made of this is an image from the making of the building um so the we used locally available materials now connecting back to my previous presentation when i said 100 mile economy i meant that we use materials that are available in and around us so which effectively means so soil from the site itself and uh, lime from sidarpet area which is uh, i think 40 kilometers from uh, puducherry or probably less uh, correct me if i'm wrong and local palm wood and uh, upcycled materials as well so if you can see this particular bottom layer bottom uh, front balcony portion it has lines right so that particular construction technology is called earth concrete technology where it uses um, construction and demolition waste we'll get into that later and we've used uh, upcycled materials like uh, petrol hose pipes so uh, so there's one corporation in the country which makes petrol hose pipes called Mit mitco they approached us saying um, we we do not want to burn petrol hose pipes what usually happens to them is you cannot use them after a year of uh, its life in petrol bunk so a large number of petrol hose pipes get discarded into the uh, discarded and what people do is they burn the rubber around so it has a metal bracing on the inside and a rubber uh, sheath so when they burn rubber they it produces toxic gases 
they burn the rubber and uh, get the scrap metal sell it for whatever money people get that's how they deal with this particular waste which is a very toxic way of dealing with it so we wanted to see if we can make use of it in construction find an alternative use so this is a classic example of upcycling uh actually not classic an unconventional uh, innovative way of upcycling a particular material finding an alternate use for it so the this is how the walls are built this is a basic technique called cob cob is nothing but a lump any lump so in this particular context it means a lump of soil so uh, i'm sure you guys have uh, your roots traced back into villages if if you recall if you think back to it you'll find you you will def, you would have definitely come across one or two earth buildings made of this techniques just mud ball stacked one on top of each other and compacted so this is the process of uh, how it is being made so here there's a guy stamping the mud with a little bit of uh, rice husk straw which is again a by product of agriculture which gives micro reinforcements into the wall uh making sure which again gives it the tensile strength to withstand it and then after making a nice uh, mix we make it into uh, loaves bread loaves like this and here in the middle image what she is doing is she is laying the cob on the wall so each day we do two feet of uh, wet construction so after it dries considerably the next day we do another two feet of construction so construction with cob and earth has many 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 advantages to it we will get into that later as well and this is another technique called adobe adobe is again another form of earth construction but instead of uh, using wet mix like in cob here we are drying we are molding the bricks molding the earth in brick format molding the soil and uh, after drying it under uh, sun we are using it for construction with mud mortar again so this is another technique of construction also what you can see here with in the middle bottom image is the palm wood which is a uh, standing with adobe wall and this is the procedure of making it on top left corner if you notice uh, he is putting the earth mix into the mold the dry mix and then you take off the cast and you dry it under the sun and uh, our depend uh, the drying really depends on the season so as when it is uh, ready for use when you know it is dried there's no set formula as such all of these earth construction is very intuitive so when you know it is ready you go ahead and construct so this is the uh, earth concreting technique that i was talking about so this particular technique was born in sacred groves where the innovation invention and uh, testing everything happened in sacred groves before it was used for the project um so one of the biggest waste produced in today's time is construction and demolition waste and it is produced in such a large scale uh, that i think it is uh, almost third or fourth uh, biggest waste that is being produced in today's time but we do not come across it in day to day life because they are dumped in outskirts land outskirts um so there are multiple ill effects that this is causing what happens is one you are destroy when we put it in open lands we are destroying the natural vegetation of that particular area um so usually they are put in outskirts wetlands where migratory birds basically come to rely, rely upon these places during winters especially so we are destroying vegetative habitats because of this waste so how do we repurpose it so what we did at sacred groves is we collected it from from wherever the demolition is happening we got it to site and devised a sieve if you can look at the bottom middle image it is a sieve designed to separate separate uh, particles of different sizes and they all get collected in different portions uh, the JC, here you can see the jcb pouring the demolition waste from top and it you know getting distributed in different different uh, places also there is a quite a bit of manual labor involved to uh, you know get the demolition waste to a proper aggregate size and uh, after that we mix it with 
uh, we the formula or the proportion of mix that we came up with at sacred groves is 18 parts of demolition waste nine parts of soil and one part of uh, cement which is an additive so if you look at the volume of material we are using instead of using completely cement 100% cement we are reducing the volume of cement utilization to uh, 18 to 1% which is a huge uh, decrease in usage of industrial material so this way this particular techniques addresses a lot of issues and uh, this is the line processing unit we have in house at sacred groves where the the image you see of the bull pulling the round stone that is called a chakki uh you so this process is used in a lot of other things like extracting oils and other processing as well traditionally uh but it is quite a rare sight to see one of these here or oh, i think there are only three of them left in tamil nadu and one is located in our site at uh, orville and uh, we use this unit to process the lime uh, to make it feasible to use for wall plasters so on the right part you see that the bullocks are pulling the pulling the stone and grinding the mix uh, usage of lime requires a, lot, a bit of processing prior to usage and uh, on bottom right corner you see the plastered walls that's the finished product you get and uh, the middle image is the flooring aspect of lime where it is used for instead of cement flooring which conventionally is being done we use lime and uh, surki which is the waste brick bats which is again a construction waste so it makes for a very good porcelainic material and what we see on the left is a bathroom finish water water resistant finish for uh, places like bathrooms and kitchens where we conventionally use tiles again tile is an industrial material which we want to omit so this particular plaster is called araish uh, which has a reflective finish and uh, it does not it is impervious to water but it allows gases to pass through it so what you see below is the is the processing you have to manually grind the mix before you apply for the plaster um yes at this point do you guys have any questions because uh, i understand that for a lot of you construction can be a bit out of context context please uh, ask if uh, there are any questions and another material is timber like i mentioned before tim coconut and palm are uh, indigenous to tamil nadu region so maybe if we are constructing in karnataka we would use something else we have a lot of mango wood available here so what we source it is very important that it is from that location you know uh, again if you recall the concept of carbon footprint uh, say i want if i want to use palmira columns in say i'm construct constructing in mysore it wouldn't make a lot of sense for me to get palm wood all the way from tamil nadu but which is happening but that is against the principles of sustainable development so going local is at the heart of sustainable and eco friendly practices so that is what we are trying to uh, practice here so this is an image before the finishing of the space where you can see bare earth walls and uh, how the wood is used just like in traditional con construction and also the mangalore tiles that has been used here is uh, is second hand mangalore tiles where it is uh, previously been used In a, on another structure, and uh, it is being repurposed here. Uh, you might ask questions about the strength of repurposing, but in case of construction materials, when you are able to use it for a second time, it means that its seasoning is properly done. It's it has stood the test of time, and that it is a strong material. So repurposing uh, tiles and even wood, for that matter, is quite a common and eco-friendly practice in construction. and these are a few finished images of the project uh this is of the middle house with this has a mud flooring again and palmira wood uh, door palmira wood beams on the top and coconut planks and you can see on the right there is a stone lintel instead of a metal one that you see uh, these days and uh, we have used arches instead of lintels in many places in order to substitute for materials and what you see here below again is the inbuilt furniture 
uh, which also doubles up as a storage place. And uh, again, this is another view where you have inbuilt storage shelves and uh, projected chajas where you can also sit and probably read a book. It's a very nice spot. And the false ceiling you see on top is also made of bamboo mats, bamboo mats, which has a line wash on it. So these are the things that we can alternate with uh, synthetic products of in today's market. Like we have a lot of POP and epoxy and all of these things. What we do not realize is on the long run, these things have detrimental effects on our health. Um, so going for a natural alternative is uh, it has multiple benefits to it. One, it has better thermal uh, cooling. Again, since these are mud walls and covered with lime plasters, they have very good insulating properties to them. So even though the temperature outside, I, I have lived in this particular space, I've stayed there, and even though it was like 36 degrees outside, I would feel comfortable sitting on the inside of this house because mud walls are usually quite thick and have a good thermal uh, thermal capacity to contain heat and slowly re release it as opposed to cement buildings which which do not give that kind of insulation so climatologically speaking as well um, earth construction becomes very relevant also if we look into the indigenous practice of that place you know before we started using uh, industrial materials like cement cement and steel uh, people built earth, uh, earth houses People built with mud with their own hands and for each other. So that's the practice that we're trying to perpetuate, uh, retaining the indigenous local practices. This is another image from the common veranda of the three houses. So previously we saw the front of the house. This is the back of the house. Again, these are Palmyra columns and uh, stone flooring here, which is used. This, this serves as a common interaction space for people. And uh, this is a beautiful mural made on the outside of the wall. This mural is made of mud and plastered with lime plaster again. So while working with natural materials, especially mud, it gives you an artistic liberty. When we are, if you have, if you're familiar with site work, if you are using cement, it, the material itself sets a lot faster. So your skill set has to be that much higher in order to make art like this. But mud gives you the luxury of time to work with it. So the workability of the material also is quite good when it comes to earth construction and poses for, you know, it gives platform for a lot of artistic expressions. Here there's an art, again a mud mural. Oh, and one very interesting factor about this house is that um, the entire house was built built by youth of India who are unskilled, people who volunteered to build this place. Um, of course, there was supervision from masons, but the earth walls and the people you see here, all of these people are, uh, they're architects or students or volunteers. They are not skilled masons. So this house was built by, you know, power of youth of India. So that is one very special aspect that is... Uh, Excuse me, uh, Ms. Chinmay. Uh, yes. Architect Nathan has joined back. Uh, okay. Sure, 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 ma'am. Uh, architect Nathan, would you like to take over from that? Nathan? I just spoke to him just a moment. All right. So while we have the time, if you have any questions, please shoot. Um, I think we can utilize this time. Ms. Chinmay, continue. Please continue. And uh, you have 10-15 uh, minutes to uh, wind right. up. Yeah, sure. So, so far we discussed about the <coughs> construction aspect of the building here. What about the workability, like I mentioned before? Um, so, 
let's look at waste management in particular of this house we vastly segregated the entire waste of the household into wet to waste and dry waste all right so this is how the wet waste is being managed even in the community so hello uh, dr deep i think i can hear you then i can mic is on hello shall i continue all right um so when we have a community set up and uh, we have amenities like common garden and uh, forest for ourselves um we get the luxury of um interacting with the wildlife and uh, and nature and with that comes the gift of earth which is capable of composting and it has its own life happening underneath our feet so we are making use of this particular aspect in planning and uh, we are composting most of uh, all of almost all of our uh, wet waste which is the food waste and in these particular houses we do not have flush toilets we have something called dry compost toilets which does not include water for its usage um so the feces is collected in compost pits the houses the house planning is designed for this particular usage and uh, there is no black water being produced so when we say sewage there are two types of uh, sewage that goes out of the house one is black water from your toilets and the other one is your kitchen and shower waste so we are <coughs> aiming at treating the shower waste within the site using uh, decentralized waste management systems um so this way what we are trying to do is not let the water or any of the waste out of the house so that it does not become a burden on another system and when it comes to dry waste management again we follow the principle of reuse upcycle or recycle which we have discussed earlier <clears throat> and the water tanks in the front of the house have a storage capacity of uh, 240000 liters which is more than sufficient so the, these three houses can house up to nine people which is more than sufficient for their yearly usage and um we spoke so much about the carbon emission and environmental impacts so construction industry is one of the top two polluters all time top two polluters because construction just doesn't stop it we keep building right so we did we ran uh, an experiment or we ran like a we did a study what would be the carbon footprint of the same house if it was built with conventional materials which is the cement and steel and all of these things which are made in industry and are bought as opposed to what we have done here which is use earth and lime and very natural materials so what we found out was uh, when we did the material analysis we are saving on up around 60% of carbon emission 60% is a very huge number considering that um, you know construction construction industry has has its carbon footprint in metric tons so it, it it's it's uh, you know kiloton uh, amount of carbon emission happens in these industries if you look up the statistics so uh, considering these aspects it's a big win and um, if each can a developer architect and a civil engineer chooses to learn about natural construction relearn them from our traditional knowledge we will be able to uh, contribute to the current global crisis in a large in a large way so that is where using local knowledge and local techniques becomes very relevant in making a global impact so uh, this is the biology aspect of how we are managing or how the building becomes eco friendly where the carbon is uh, so when it comes to wood we call wood carbon bank because throughout its life cycle it keeps uh, taking in carbon dioxide and gives out oxygen right so it is a carbon capturing system in itself so when we do not let a tree fall and rot away in the forest when the tree starts rotting it produces methane which is again 36 times worse than carbon dioxide as a greenhouse gas so when we use uh, wood or timber in construction 
um, we are essentially capturing the carbon and petrifying it and using it, using it for something else. So instead of letting the trees decay or uh, catch forest fires, using timber, sensibly using timber, not in large scale way where there's nothing left to left for the next generation, but sensibly using timber in construction avails for something really, really good. And uh, this is another micro project that is in the sacred in sacred groves. This dormitory is completely built with uh, palm wood, using all the components of palm. If you've seen a palm tree, there is a stem that connects the leaf to the trunk of the tree. So what you see on the right top corner here are the palm stems, which are used as partition walls for the uh, for the walls. And uh, the tree trunks are made of palm, and the steps. All of that. So this particular dormitory holds up to 20 people, uh, 20 people. And um, so with all of these innovations and reinventing techniques, what we are essentially trying to do is go back to a time of construction where people built for each other in a very, uh, in a very nice way, where construction was a communal activity. In today's context, if you want to build, if, say, uh, I want to build a house right now, I decide to build a house. If I am not financially <clears throat> well off, I have to start thinking about housing, housing loans and uh, the cost that construction would incur. So, um, and of course, there's uh, there are things like pollution and mining, which we've already spoken a lot about. So there was one attempt to revive the old technique of construction where communities built for each other. And we called that build free. So this is a common communal scene that uh, we see at Sacred Groves where we uh, meet and uh, work together in workshops and things like that. So this particular event uh, focused on inviting people to build with us and making it into a festival where people, if you've seen pottery, you keep stamping and you have a lot of fun with them, right? So that is how the whole atmosphere was when everybody was building with us and there were children and music and food and art everywhere. So, um, so this is the house that continued construction where a lot of volunteer energy went into construction and there was very minimal investment. So everything the house is built with is procured from in and around the house. And uh, this is a house called, we call it uh, One Love House because uh, uh, it all, the reason for it's because it is standing is the love and energy that people have put. So if you can see, you can see the bare structure here, it is made of earth, bamboo, and uh, you can see the finished structure here, which is covered with lime. And if you notice the front uh, front window here, we have utilized scrap metals, scrap metals to give a grill instead of using fresh metal, which is what we usually have in our home windows. And for windows here, we is it is made of uh, bamboo, completely made of bamboo. So and uh, these are a few images of the interior of the house um, where the flooring, if you notice, it is made of made of repurposed stone, like the kadapa stone, which are cut and which are which are usually not used for mainstream construction. We have repurposed it by placing it in mosaic format and uh, earth walls and mural art on the walls. You can see the Nataraja mural here and the roof is made of bamboo. Bamboo and a line. Here you can see the middle image. This is the this is the bathroom wall. It looks extremely fancy, but this is the bathroom wall made of waste mirror, broken mirror pieces, and uh, stained glass pieces. And the bottom surface is against the again the same plaster I mentioned before, the smooth lime plaster. So this is how the bathroom works. So this house can hold up to two people. And uh, the overall construction cost came up to 73,000 um, mm -hmm. because the, the materials were sourced locally and the labor cost was completely eliminated because we built for each other. Volunteers put their time and energy to build the structure. So it is, a, it is quite a far-fetched idea, but that is the dream that if we can 
bring in the community aspect uh, which indigenously we did have and we still do have in our villages back into construction uh, we can make wonders this is another example of alternate construction technique it is the earth back dome uh, so what we do here is we are upcycling cement waste cement bags we are taking the empty cement bags if you notice the bottom right image here we are filling it with a mixture of soil and and ramming it laying it layer wise and ramming it and uh, this is one of the very fast construction fast and cost effective way of construction especially in today's time uh, it was invented by an architect called nadir khalili it was an, it is again an innovation in the time of need he he is an architect from the middle east where uh, these such domes became very relevant to them and it is a very fast paced construction so this is a sort of innovation that we need to look into while going forward so this is an again a small space of 4 meter diameter and a single structure with an intermediate level which can be utilized and uh, coming to uh, i'll give you a few more examples of projects outside of this particular context of orovil because orovil offers a unique uh, context and advantage to such thought processes this is a farm house again built with earth walls and uh, stone and wood and again lime of course it is it is a farm house and it has two bedrooms a kitchen and uh, two bathrooms and a hall so these are a few finished interior images you can see urban plasters in paints and uh, terracotta tiles at the bottom and the kitchen counter and that is the if you if you notice this uh, spiral staircase that is a single trunk of a eucalyptus tree uh and has uh, treads to go the steps are made of uh, mango wood to go to the top level to the terrace level and the stone that has been used as the uh, as the door frame here is the waste from the quarry only the arch if you notice have a clean cut so this is all repurposed again these are by products of uh, uh mining and this is a beautiful mural inside the house again made with mud and uh, mud, natural mud paint so this is about sacred groves uh sacred groves and the community construction that we carry forward and i'd like to present to you another project that architect nitin is currently working it is located in uh, udupi coastal region of karnataka it is it is a 5 bhk uh a uh, 5 bhk project five bed bedroom hall kitchen um so it is completely made of uh, built with traditional construction technology when so this is where we uh, have to understand the relevance of context here the kind of construction technology we have used is different so one moment what we what we have used here are laterite stones because laterite stones are indigenously available in udupi and coastal regions of karnataka it it makes sense for us to use laterite in in that particular region and lime is also abundantly available in uh, udupi region but if we recall what we used in pondicherry orovil region we used mostly earth because that is what was abundantly available so what is locally available is something that we need to aim to utilize coming into construction techniques this is the view from far this is the street view and yeah so the foundation is made of uh, granite stone to give a good compressive strength and lime mortar lime mortar again so the processing of lime is very important uh when it comes to uh, lime in construction it is very important to understand the science behind it what we are essentially trying to do with lime is we get lime in various forms in form of limestone from the earth when we mine it or we get it in the form of sea shells from the from the coast so since in this particular context it is close to coast our source of lime was sea shells and we process it with uh, sand sand as well as uh, additives like jaggery yes the jaggery that we eat 
at home uh, you know as a substitute for sugar that as well as bale fruit so when it comes to natural construction um, different regions adapt depending upon the resources and materials that is that that particular place is enriched with so if we consider similar construct same lime ut- utilization somewhere in north north india the recipe for this particular uh, technique would be different for using lime mortar so when it comes to natural construction and alternate construction uh, working with your hands and having that on site experience becomes very important so this particular what is happening in this image is they have let the, they have a mixture of lime ready and they are uh, fermenting the lime for for around 2 weeks we have to ferment it depending again depending on the weather condition after which we can use it for uh, construction and here we have used it as mortars between the uh, between the stones for uh, as an adhesive and uh, another major material used in this project is uh, timber and the timber here used is all repurposed timber um there are a lot of buildings that are being taken down in uh, you know in village regions these days and what happens to the material which come out when we demolish it we saw the demolition waste from cities which we have tried to repurpose and when it comes to old houses where they have beautiful uh, wooden columns present we try to use it again reuse it in in newer projects that can also be done so this is like uh, as getting a load of uh, timber for the construction site repurposed wood so this is how the wood again is uh, processed because because it is old wood it needs a bit of uh, planing and cleaning up and after that it has been used for uh, if it has been used as a floor slab between the levels and uh, this again is red oxide technique which you will notice usually in older houses but fortunately uh, the masons that were, that got involved in this project were heritage masons who who had the indigenous knowledge still intact so when it comes to construction and you want to do natural construction that is the biggest issue that we face that there are there's nobody that knows the technique of using natural materials but uh, again we need to do our research and uh, follow up with people who are conserving techniques so that was a lot of work that architect nitin had had uh, put in to make this project happen and find the right people to work with uh, this is an image from the back this is again lime plastered and uh, laterite co- laterite columns and they are um, you can see them are uh, applying oxide flooring on the floor here and the image on the right is the image of front porch uh, again ma'am, uh, excuse me ma'am you have yes, uh, five ma'am. more minutes to mind yes ma'am sure sure definitely so this is again repurposed wooden columns we uh, that have been carved and this is the uh, under construction interior of the house lime plastered and uh, tiles are also like in the previous project these are repurposed tiles and we can see wooden frames and doors and windows and this is these are a few images of the interiors at the current stage the project is still in completion right now um yeah and this is the kitchen region where we've used a few uh, light tiles so that there's light on the interior throughout the day so that we don't have to use a light source an artificial light source like a bulb right and this again is inbuilt furniture with an oxide finish so that you don't have to invest further in invest further in uh, into your furnitures uh, all right that's that's about the uh, house from udupi now to about one thing one aspect that pops up when we say earth construction is longevity so this is an example from uh, shimoga region this is a house that has stood around for around 400 years that i came across so you can see that the bare wall is completely exposed and it is made of earth and it is still standing and people live inside so not just in india all across the world there are 
earth earth structures which are uh, 400 years old 11 story structures in yemen which are still standing so just uh, earth construction has disappeared not because it is uh, not good but because of other so- social factors because people want past construction and there is a societal stigma that earth construction is you know kacha but if you really look and in, look into the scientific aspects of earth construction it is it is very long lasting it outlasts even cement buildings the life expectancy of a concrete building is around 70 70 years and that's it though so the structural integrity is lost after that but earth and natural construction does not have that limit you can done in the right way it it outlasts the conventional buildings so these are a few traditional uh, examples of roofs that are still standing and uh, yeah you can so whenever we come across state uh, sites that are being demolished uh, we stand and take a look at what is happening inside because to learn about earth construction or natural alternate construction it's become very rare the knowledge is disappear so we have to grasp any source of knowledge that we have available here we have we can see the stone cut stone slabs granite slabs being used for roofing and uh, mud walls again i think this is these are burnt bricks and lime plastered walls and uh, this is one example from mandya region in nagmangla taluk so where where stone is abundantly available where there are a lot of hills if you know like adi chinchingiri region uh, there are the local material available there is stone so like we saw in different contexts in udupi we used laterite stone in pondicherry we used earth so here what is available is stone uh, along with earth but stone is definitely a sturdier material for construction so the people who lived there used their local material so these are a few images from that and i think that's the end of the presentation about construction thank you uh thank you ms chinmayi students you have any questions so i have a basic question uh, to you regarding this uh, will there be any uh, revolution going to happen in another 10 15 years in the construction because uh, whatever methods you said people uh, ha- uh, are not educated about all these things and as you told uh, they want fast construction they love to finish off it early quickly okay. uh, right. so we, we, there is a way to teach people or educate people about this right um yes definitely there is a way to educate people i i believe uh, um ideally we should we should be made aware of the consequences of uh, what we are using to build our homes with from the beginning uh, in the sense that just like with whatever uh you know materials that we are using like we spoke about bamboo brush and a lot of people did not know about it just similarly it is important to know what sort of home we are living in so um so uh is there going to be a revolution there is definitely a spread of awareness that is happening because especially because of covid people are open to the idea and you know are listening to uh reason when we say that environmental factors are important when while constructing or anything so there are alternate techniques as well Uh, i did not have the time to mention all the techniques let me so some right now currently uh, we are striking a balance somewhere in between in construction industry where is where uh, uh, hybrid construction is in trend right now uh, i'll i'm sharing my screen again and showing you this particular technique of construction called compressed stabilized earth blocks which is uh, which you can quite commonly see in mysore as well a few architects are uh, uh, practicing this particular technique of construction where uh, earth is compressed instead of using burnt bricks or cement bricks earth bricks are compressed with a little bit of cement stabilization or even without stabilization uh, and uh, houses are built good houses are built with uh, this particular technique so slowly there is a slight change in market that we are seeing but i suppose the revolution is quite a quite a way ahead and uh, it really it's up to all of us to be able to make that happen 
I hope for the best. Uh, probably, as you told, the COVID and other pandemics, people learn for and they go for the better methods uh, in uh, everything that they do. Yes. Uh, thank you once again, uh, Ms. Chinmayi, for uh, spending your valuable time with us. You have educated with us about the sustainability, the eco-friendly habits, uh, and the technology, and how we can contribute uh, in smaller ways uh, so that. Uh, uh, the, uh, the sustainability or the eco-friendly technology uh, uh, will uh, spread in every way. Thank you so much once again. Uh, now I request uh, Dr. Sankarshan to give away the formal vote of thanks. Thank you, Dr. Deepa. Um, Ma'am, I had a question. Yeah. Hello? Yeah. Go ahead. Uh, Ma'am, how do we apply these constructions in big cities where the population is very high and people have mm -hmm. to live in flats? Right. So that's where innovation comes into picture again. We have quite a long way to go there. But uh, currently what is happening is, uh, if you notice column structures, most of the high skyscraper structures are column and frame structures. I hope you understand what I mean. Um, so the um, so the load bearing aspect of the structure is made with cement and steel, but the wall in between can still be made of earthen materials. Can still be substituted substituted with uh, materials which have low embodied energy and eco friendly materials. So uh, I understand that it uh, the city context can be quite challenging. But uh, that that's what we need to work towards. So, like I said, you can have different types of partition walls in between in such context where the structure is taken care of, but in, on the interior, you're trying to use something that is e more eco-friendly and nature-friendly. So that is one aspect that you can do. It really depends on the context that you are working in when it comes to uh, natural construction, alternate construction. I okay. Thank you. Thank you, Samidhi. So, if there are no questions, let us conclude with a formal vote of thanks. A warm and graceful morning to everyone. It's a great privilege to propose vote of thanks. So now we are uh, we are honored to have amongst us architect Chinmay M. S. as our guest of honor and the speaker of today's function. On behalf of NIE. I extend sincere thanks to you, madam. Thank you, madam. Thank you very much for the opportunity. It's our privilege. So my heartfelt thanks to Professor N. V. Raghavendra, Principal, NIE Mysore, for his encouragement and support. I cordially thank the Dean, HODs, and faculty members of all the departments of NIE for their support and involvement. On behalf of the Department of Physics, I would like to thank NIE Society, NIE MC Directors for their continuous encouragement and support. I would like to acknowledge my gratitude to HOD of Department of Physics for his support and valuable input. My heartfelt thanks to Professor R. Gopalakrishna Aras, Department of Physics, NIE Mysuru, for his consistent guidance and support. So I would uh, like to thank extend my thanks to all the participants without whom this event would not be possible. And I would also like to thank uh, the, we have received various number of, uh, a good number of entries for our national level best out of waste competition. I would like to thank all the participants. I would like to congratulate Dinesh Kumar, Shahin Afzana and Vignesh V who have got the prizes in this competition. Congratulations to all. I would like to thank the coordinators and organizers for all their efforts in making this event run smoothly. I would also like to thank the YouTube live stream viewers of this function. Once again, thank you. Thank you. Uh, special thanks to uh, uh, the organizing committee. Uh, this Sunday, uh, even being Sunday, they have uh, come over here to the college and uh, organize this event. Thank you once again, uh, my personally, and also thanks to my dear students uh, for, for your active participation. So we'll have uh, these programs in future as well and make it, I hope this is uh, useful to you. Uh, thank you once again, have a great day.
Uh, there is a small announcement. Those who have actively participated in this event, please do fill the feedback form. You will be getting the participation certificate. And uh, for uh, those who have got the prizes, we will be sending the receipt and also the certificate to your email ID. Okay, thank you. Thank you, one and all. Have a great day.